I got a secret. So don't let the devil go to God on your behalf. Look here. I don't need the devil speaking for me. Okay. Hello, my name is Tamaria Jordan, and I am the host of the Confidence Restored podcast. And today you are in for a treat. I felt led to record this message because oftentimes we sin in secret. And so I thought about the definition and the meaning of the word secret. And a secret means to uh, the adjective not known or seen or not meant to be known or seen by others. And so I started to think about life. I I started to think about everything that is happening that we see um, in the news, the headlines. A lot of things that were previously hidden are now coming to light. And so I started to think about my own life and thank you, Lord, for grace and mercy is all I can say. Because as I thought about my life, Psalms 19.12 reminds us, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. And I started to think about the fact that there are things that even I have done that I'm ashamed of that I don't want anyone to know. But as we think about life, we think about God's grace, we think about God's mercy. The thing is, God will have mercy on us, but we have to be willing to confess our sins. And so Proverbs 28, 13 says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth forsaketh them shall have mercy. And so I started to think about confession of sins. I started to think about my own life. And I literally, the thing that kept coming to mind was sinning in secret. And I was like, sheesh, God is talking to me. But he is also talking to other believers in this hour, because if you look at the news headlines and you see the things that are happening with the church specifically, and even outside of the church, things that were previously done in secret behind the scenes, no one knew, but you, now they are being exposed. And I think part of this is due to the fact that God is really calling us, especially the the body of Christ, those who believe that Jesus died for our sins and rose again, that we are to repent. And repenting just means that we are individuals who are turning away from sin and dedicating our lives to Christ. We feel conviction. We feel some regret about what we have done and or what we may be doing. Whereas when you think about condemnation, the Bible does say that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That means that when we think about the word condemnation in and of itself, and let me make sure that I give you the formal definition of the word, but when we think about condemnation or to condemn someone, essentially that means to declare them as reprehensible, wrong, evil, pronounced guilty and sentenced to punishment, sentenced to death. And when we think about what Jesus did on the cross for us, he died to cover our sins. So because Jesus has died to cover our sins, we know that we can live again. So there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And so I am grateful, very grateful (laughs) for that revelation and also for that mercy for that grace. But it is something that I want us to be mindful of um, because it's something that's important, especially as we think about what it means to hide, what it means to share, what it means to um, be open about those things that we are going through. And it's Romans 8, 1 that says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But that doesn't mean that we cannot have victory through our convictions and knowing because God also corrects those whom he loves. It reminds us that God corrects us because the thing is, everyone has sinned. Romans 5, the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, meaning Adam. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. And so Jesus 
He literally intercedes for us. In Romans 8, 34, it says, who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. He stands in the gap for us, but he can't stand in the gap for us that we are not willing to repent and turn away from our sins and say, you know what, Lord, this is what I did. And so um, probably, I can't remember when it was, but like a few months back, I had the revelation and in my spirit, I felt like, you know, you, when we play with God's, God's grace, essentially. So you are playing with God's grace at this point when you think that you can get away with whatever it is you're doing. And it just made me think about the fact that oftentimes because others can't see what we do, others can't see what we say, others don't know our heart, they don't know what we're thinking. Sometimes people think, oh, I've gotten away with it. And God's like, no, you haven't gotten away with it. What you're doing is making it harder for you to see the sin because it's in secret. And so when I think about that, and we think about the fact that all of us were born into sin, but we can overcome that sin. And I always say to myself, don't let the devil go to God on your behalf. Look here, I don't need the devil speaking for me. Okay. (laughs) I can speak for myself and I can go to God and repent. And so God has been sending out warnings, prophetic messages to allow us time to get it right. And so often people get offended because someone says, hey, you know what? That's not right. You should do something different. You should consider how you're moving. You can. You should consider, um, you know, the decisions that you're making. And the enemy's like, no, stay quiet. I want you to be quiet. I want you to do what you do in in your room, in your house, in your mind, in your heart. I want you to keep all that stuff covered because the enemy will come. And he will tell God, look at your, look at your children, look at what they did. And he wants to tell God on us. He wants to say, you know what? Look, let me let me tell you about them. Let me tell you about what's going on with your child. You know what I'm saying? He wants to um, go to God on our behalf. So one example of this in the Bible is in Job. And it's interesting because Satan went to God and asked, could he test him? In Job 1, 7, and the Lord said unto Satan, whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down it. Essentially, he wanted to let him know there are no people that are holy. So he said, walking up and down in it, in the earth. And the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge around him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But essentially, Satan wanted to say, you know what? Hey, There is no one righteous. There is no one good in the earth. And that's when the Lord said, but Job. And so it's interesting um, because in verse six, before it even started, it says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. And so when you think about Satan, Satan, the enemy, the devil, he roams around seeking those whom he can devour. And how he gets us is the fact that we don't want to share and not saying we have to share with the world or share with other people all of our secret sins or the things we've done, the skeletons in our closet. But it is worth mentioning that we have to go to God and repent. And so in Ephesians 5, it says, verse 12, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. And so people are they are embarrassed because they don't want anyone to know what they are doing. And so they are ashamed of the things that they do in secret. But in Ephesians 5 verse 8, it says, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So yes, 
we may have been born in darkness. We may have been doing things that were not good. And even at the beginning of Ephesians 5, it talks about the fact that we are followers of God as dear children. And we walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. But be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And so as it continues on in verse nine, for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whosoever doeth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, thinking what we do, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And it talks about not being drunk with wine and in excess, but being filled with the spirit of God. And so as I think about this, as I think about what's happening right now, the church is literally arguing about people that they idolize. They're arguing about who's right and who's wrong. They're arguing about the fact you know, that we can't judge one another. And it, I do understand that because the Bible does say in Matthew 7, the way that we, we judge, we will be judged. But I will say that there's a thing called righteous judgment. And righteous judgment is essentially going to your brother and telling them like, hey, this is wrong. But I think the issue that we have now is we don't want to offend. And so I remember writing a poem after I heard a prophetic message and I said, we are also in sin because we are afraid to offend. But in John 7, 24, it says, Jesus tells his listeners to judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So not basing things on what it looks like, but on the moral truth and God's standards. And the thing is, when we feel conviction, we know when we've done wrong, myself included, but people don't want us to speak to those things that are in darkness. They want us to essentially pretend as though everything is fine. They want us to pretend that we don't have any secret sin. And when we pretend we don't have secret sin, how can we praise the God that lives within? It makes it real hard to be cleansed. And in Psalm 19, 12, again, it says, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults, the things that are hidden, the things that I don't want people to know, the things I don't want people to see. And when I think about Revelation, in Revelation 12, it talks about the fact that we overcome the enemy by our testimony. So we know that the devil was cast down to the earth. So in Revelations 12, verse nine, it says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Remember earlier I said, don't let Satan go to God on your behalf. He's accusing us day and night. He already knows like what we did. We know what we did. God knows what we did. And verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, 
and they love not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So mm, as I continue on verse 13, and when the dragon saw that he was cast out of the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half of time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have testimony of Jesus Christ. And so the reason that I share this is the enemy is wroth with anger and he has gone out to make war with the remnant, those who are left of her seed, those who keep the commandments of God. So the persecution of the church, now, look, they don't even have to persecute the church because we're just doing everything the world's doing. We are sinning like the world's sinning. We are hiding in secret like the world's hiding in secret. And God is like, now is the time of exposure. And if you don't want to be exposed, you need to repent. You need to go to God and tell God what you've done what's in your heart, because he already knows it anyway. And I literally, every day at this point, I'm like, I know I have to repent for something because I'm sure there's something I said, I did, I thought that was not in line with the word of God. And so I wrote some things down in my phone. And as God gives me things, I always write them down. And so I have so many quotes. I have quotes for days, um, just things that God gives me like randomly. So one thing he gave me the other day was, don't play in God's face by abusing God's grace. And so many people right now, it's like, you know what? They got away with it. This one got away with it and nothing happened to them. So guess what? I can get away with it too. And God is like, mm, not quite. Some people may get away with it, but that doesn't mean that you will. And so it is going to be important, especially in these days, to watch and pray. Luke 21 tells us to watch and pray always that we may be able to escape the things that are, that are to come because they're coming and there is nothing we can do to stop it. When God's word goes forth, God's word will be fulfilled. And so the thing is, a lot of people don't want to hear. They don't understand what's happening. They're not paying attention, but that's exactly what the enemy wants us to do. He does not want us to pay attention. So earlier um, in last year, in the summer, I authored and released Sins, Salvation is the New Sexy. And the reason I'm sharing this is because I personally had an issue with lust myself, meaning I wanted to do certain things. I wanted to be a certain way to appeal to the opposite sex, especially in my single days. You know, I wasn't saying that I was out here being promiscuous. However, I will admit that I personally had a lustful nature, which most of us do if we're honest with ourselves. And lust in and of itself, I heard a prophet say um, from the master's voice prophecy blog, she said, the thing with lust is it's an insatiable, um, hunger for something. And when I read the definition, it says usually intense or unbridled sexual desire, but it could also mean an intense longing and eagerness, pleasure, delight. We can lust over a lot of things. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's sexual, but it could mean to have an intense desire or need for food, for TV, for whatever it is. We can lust after a lot of stuff. Um, but I wrote this particularly because I feel like society promotes sin, but I have learned salvation is where true freedom begins. And even for me, I've had a lot of turning points in my life where I'm like, oh my God, thank you for the revelation because I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I'm going to keep getting a pass because someone else got a pass and God does not work that way. God is like, look here, if you keep on playing, <laughs> you don't know if you will like where you will be laying, whether that is in hell for eternity or with God. And so I was like, oh my goodness, like this is so powerful. So when I think about 
specifically, um, when I look at the, there's a chapter in the book um, and I called it demon time, overcoming temptation. And I talked about the fact that we are all tempted, but we do have an opportunity to turn away from sin. And it's interesting because we don't want to confront it. We want to hide what we're doing behind the scenes. We don't want anyone to know, but God knows. So there's a chapter called demon time, overcoming temptation. And then right after that, it's called the turning point. And that is when the character in the book had a turning point in her own life. But I think about my own turning point and I say, thank you, God, for allowing me to get it right within so I don't have to die in my sin. Because when I think about life and I think about repentance, it's powerful. And so um, on one of the pages, page 59, it says, Kiva made a U-turn when she realized she was going in the wrong direction. Much like her, you may have a longing for God and have realized that you are going the wrong way. Today, you can choose to follow a new path of righteousness and obedience to God. It's a transformative act that leads to reconciliation, restoration, and a deeper relationship with God. And for me, I realized that I thought confidence was about what I looked like. I thought confidence was about what I felt like, but God was like, no, it's about restoring faith in me, faith, confidence, trust, belief. And I said, wow, I thank God for that, um, that alignment. I thank God for his grace, for his mercy, because he does give us chances and chances and chances and chances. And guess what? Chances <laughs> to get it right. And a lot of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we don't want to get it right because we want to look like what we enjoy. We want to look like the world. We want to be in the world and of the world. And the word reminds us not to be of the world. We live in the world, but we don't have to be of the world. But oftentimes we don't want to, we don't want anyone to know. In Isaiah 29, 15, it says, woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord and their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us? Who knoweth us? God, <laughs> the enemy is going and telling God about you every day. Look at them. They, they, they praise your name in church. And actually I recorded a, a recent podcast episode where I talked about, um, it was episode 109 and I said, Sinning on Saturday, saved on Sunday. It's a lot of us who are like, okay, you know what? As long as no one knows, but God is about to expose. And while he is giving us time, we need to get it right. We need to repent and go to God. And then not only do we need to repent, but we also should change our ways. Because when you repent, you will become convicted because God will convict those whom he loves. And the word says that, and I realize that more and more, like the reason I feel conviction is not because God doesn't love me. The reason I feel conviction is because God is like, okay, now I've dealt with this sin in your life. Now I want to help you here. And oftentimes we might get offended, but God is like, I'm going to help you. Second Corinthians seven verses nine through 10. As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So worldly grief produces death. But when we repent to God, we know that there's life on the other side of that. When we acknowledge the fact that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and we know that God when he convicts us, it's not about convicting us to say, you know what, look what you did. You're terrible. You're horrible. Like you can never get it right. No, we can't get it right. Not without God. Without God, we're going to keep on messing up. We're going to keep on making mistakes. We're going to keep on disappointing God. But when we repent because we are sorry, when we know that our deeds are evil, when we know, you know what? Okay, God. I thank you because you are changing me. I thank you that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I thank you because you love me. I thank you because you care enough about me to help me turn away and repent. 
And so John 3, 19 through 21, and this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light lest his deeds shall be reproved. But he that doeth truth, truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. And I know we talked about that earlier. John 16, 8, and when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Hebrews 11, 1, this is speaking specifically about confidence. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And also in Hebrews 10, 35, it says, do not throw away your confidence for it will be richly rewarded. But it talks about persevering and persevering and be like having patient is really being able to stand firm in the face of trials and tribulation. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. John 6, 44, no man can come to me except the father, which hath sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. God is literally trying to help us. God loves us. Romans 10.17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God loves us. He does not want to see us perish. God does not want to see the wicked perish. He doesn't. So, and that means us as well. He does not want to see us perish um, in our unrighteousness. He wants to see us repent and come back to God. But his word is true. And so we have to remember that because in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slacking concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the King James Version says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but in, is long suffering to us ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he wants us to repent. He wants us to come back to him. He wants us to know that he corrects us because he loves us. He loves us. If he didn't, he would just let us perish. But in Proverbs 3.12, and that's where I will end this episode, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, ever as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. God loves us. So God will correct us. And so I call this sinning in secret because no one wins when we sin. And that includes us. The enemy has us deceived thinking, hey, you're going to get away with it. You'll get a pass. This pastor got a pass. You'll get a pass. That person got a pass. You'll get a pass. That is not how God works. Now it's time to press the gas on repentance and repent every day for the sins that are secret, the sins that are hidden, the things that we don't know, um, or not necessarily that we don't know, but the things that we may be blind to, the things that we no longer see, the things that we have made excuses for, the things that other people have made excuses for and told us, hey, it's okay. You can do that. I did it. And then what happens? We all fall into sin. <laughs> and again, no one wins. So I hope that you will share this message with someone else. And for anyone who is not familiar with the prayer of salvation, um, the Lord always tells us we don't have to come to him with vain repetition, but literally he wants us to be repentant and just come to him and be true to who we are. And so um, I will post the prayer of salvation. And here you see it's it's very, really simple. And I will also give you the scripture for where the Bible says, this is how you shall pray. But a simple prayer of salvation is literally asking God to come into your heart. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I repent of my sins and make you Lord over my life. Take complete control of my life and help me walk in righteousness daily. Now that is just a basic prayer. 
Um, but the word tells us like how we should pray. And that is actually in Luke 11. Um, and it talks to us about how we should pray. And also in Matthew 6. And in Matthew 6, it says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward who? You. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. And I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for your lessons. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for everyone listening to this podcast today. I pray that it would bless their spirit. It will encourage their soul and it would guide someone into repentance and a closer relationship with you. So, On that note, I just want to thank you all, as always, for your support and tuning in. Thank you for allowing me to share my testimony, and I pray that it blesses you today. So in the words of my late great-grandmother, keep on keeping on. Be blessed.